श्री अरविंदाय नम इट इज़ अ मैटर ऑफ ग्रेट प्लेजर मोर देन प्लेजर ऑलवेज अ डीपर एक्सपीरियंस फॉर मी टू कम एंड मेक अ स्मॉल ऑफरिंग थ्रू माय स्पीच इन दिस हॉल एंड सो टुडे ऑन फिफ्टींथ ऑफ मे I am going to talk about reassertion of sanatan dharma as made in the uttar pada speech of shri aurobindo the speech was published in 1909 but uh, it was made i think about 2 years earlier when he came out of the alipur jail almost immediately after and he addressed not a large political gathering or any gathering of a political concern but he addressed a society of religious people or rather people who were interested in living examining and experiencing the place of religion in society and he said that he is going to make not a political speech but a religious uh observation or something about religion but when we see the whole speech that he made then we find that this particular speech is as political as any speech can be but it is at the highest level it is at that level where politics is not concerned with a person with a party or even with one stretch of land or a nation but is concerned with the cosmos with the vishwa with the brahmand and it is at this level that the speech can be called political you may say if it is a speech about brahmand about the place of individual about the place of india in the cosmos in the whole world in the committee of nations if it is a speech about that then what is the connection with religion religion spirituality what is the connection and it is in this way that we see that shri aurobindo not only raises what is political understanding to the highest level but also brings down that consciousness to be applied to something very practical and that is the rise of india as a nation and in that is included at that time in 1907 or so it was included the independence of india so it is something which concerns the independence of india from the british rule and hence it is an entirely political concern but the way he prescribes the way he prescribes to us to achieve this independence and what to follow after that independence has come is something which is the most valuable part of it and that is purely religious and that is the moving spirit of shri aurobindo now at this juncture 
Sri Aurobindo, the revolutionary, the one who was not somebody who preached seeking India's independence through quote-unquote non-violent means as later on Mahatma Gandhi did through civil rights and move, uh, movement, no. But one who had some other ways and who was in touch with people who wanted the independence of India through a direct conflict and winning independence by seizing it from the British. Now, it is this revolutionary Sri Aurobindo who has made this transition and who makes this great transition from an active revolutionary, one who with his own body and mind is present physically in that political movement. From that, he makes a transformation into that support for India's independence struggle through his great spiritual force. And in this speech, he gives an account of how that happened. So to my mind, this speech in Sri Aurobindo's own words tells us about how from an active political revolutionary he becomes a great yogi who is secluded but yet who is working and supporting the struggle for independence of India through his spiritual power and spiritual tej. Now this is not a speculation that I am making. You see, most people think that Sri Aurobindo retired from active politics. This is a common misconception and in the minds of some it is a complaint that he should not have done that. India may have gained independence in the 20s. Many people think that way. Now this speech makes it clear the Shri Aurobindo was there all the time behind the struggle through his spiritual power. But why did this happen? How did this happen? And what is the logic of it? Why it was nothing wrong but something in, something in the great Indian tradition of how the spiritually advanced people support the everyday activities of human beings at the very ground level, at the very material level. Because as you know, the Sri Aurobindo developed the integral yoga in which nothing is left out, in which Yoga is not divorced from any material activity but makes that material activity more powerful, more meaningful and full of the touch of divinity. Now this speech is the proof of his own experience. So I will quote a lot from this. I will give you not just the proof but the whole sequence of what he said in his own words. And you will also understand that how he prescribed that assertion of Sanatan Dharma is the great political struggle of India. It is not a struggle which was to conclude with achieving transfer of power or political independence from the British. 
but it was something to continue within India, outside India, for the rest of the world. Because the great role that Sri Aurobindo sees here for India is not that of a nation wanting something just for itself. Although it was the great need of the time to be independent from foreign rule, however, Sri Aurobindo sees beyond. He says the role of India is to give Sanatan Dharma to rest of the world. And reassertion of that Sanatan Dharma is unique because it is not some kind of a cultural imposition of Indian values on the rest of the world. It is not some kind of an aggrandizement. It is not even in any way a sophisticated conquest, but it is giving the world something most beautiful something eternal, something sanatan, something which the world will find highly elevating. So let us see what he has to say. So he first of all makes it clear that the subject of his speech today would be Hindu religion. It's not just religion, Hindu religion. He uses the word Hindu religion. Shri Aurobindo never minces words. Today, after something like 70 years of living under the jargon of secularism, we are hesitant to use those very words which our ancestors have used for the last 5,000 years. Not so with Shri Aurobindo. Now, he says that he came to the same place a year ago. And when he came, that is just before he went to jail, this whole place, which is Uttarpara, was full alive, as he says, when I went to jail, the whole country was alive with the cry of Bande Matram alive with the hope of a nation, the hope of millions of men who had newly risen out of degradation. I came out of jail, I listened for that cry, but there was silence." Unquote. So, he is talking about the change in political scenario. Because that ferment which was on at that time particularly with the uh, activity of Bipin Chandrapal, that was missing at this time. Then he recalls that when Bipin Chandrapal came out of jail, he came with a message and it was an inspired message. Now he mentions this with a reason. It's not just that he is giving us a bit of anecdota, something, a little memory, no. There is a reason. He says when Bipin Chandrapal came out, he made a speech here, that is in the same forum in which Sri Aurobindo was making. And he said it, he also gave a speech that was more religious and less political. He spoke, now this is quote, he spoke of his realization in jail. Bipin Chandrapal spoke of his realization in jail of God within us all, of the Lord within the nation. And in his subsequent speeches, he also spoke of a greater than ordinary force in the movement and a greater than ordinary purpose before it. 
lips of Shri Aurobindo is saying, which I just said as a prolegomena to this speech, that Shri or that Bipin Chandrapal also made a speech which was more religious in nature, less political, which talked of the divinity within the nation. God here is to be taken not in the sense of a uh, Abrahamic God, but in the sense of the Indian darshanas, in the sense of the divine that Sri Aurobindo and the mother has always talked about. And he says that Bipin Chandra Pal talked of a purpose of the political struggle for independence of India and of a purpose higher than that struggle. So you see, Sri Aurobindo makes it clear that he is following the example of Vipin Chandra and he is saying something now which is along the same lines. He says that Vipin Chandrapal received a message in the Baksar jail. Vipin Chandrapal was imprisoned in the Baksar jail. And he says that he got a message and he gave that message to you and he talked about it, Bipin Chandrapal. But Sri Aurobindo says that he also got a message in Alipur jail and hence he is going to talk about that message. So what is this message? And he says that he got this message and he has been commanded to give this message to people, all people. Now, this is also very important for us to understand. Sri Aurobindo had this great spiritual experience, as I'll talk about and quote him in Alipur jail. He could have just been content with his experience and moved on with his experience. He need not have talked to others about it. Because it's a private experience that the individual has and in the spiritual journey of the individual that experience is extremely valuable. Having had that experience, Sri Aurobindo could have easily went ahead and done, and did, and done what he did. But no, he talks about it. He gives us this message and because he gave us this message, it is important that we remember that message, that we again and again study and try to discover what is in depth the real message. He says that he knew that he would be out of jail. But there were times when he had great doubt. Quote, therefore I faltered for a moment and cried my heart to God. What is this that has happened to me? I believe that I had a mission to work for the people of my country. And until that work was done, I should have thy protection. Why then am I here on such a charge? Unquote. So this is the spirit this is the, the inner voice of Sri Aurobindo crying out to the ultimate that I was supposed to go and work for India's independence. I was doing that work. So my Lord, why have you put me into jail? Why have you obstructed that journey of mine? And I made this complaint and I waited that there should be an answer. He said that before he had gone to jail or before this whole event developed, about a year ago, he had this urge that he should go into seclusion, that he should give up. What he meant was he should give up politics. 
there was some sort of a call but he was weak quote i was weak and could not accept the call so he says that something like this happened earlier but he says that this whole experience went through a particular methodology in alipur jail and the great transition happened during that time and what he heard or what he felt or what he got was quote the bonds you had not the strength to break i have broken for you because it is not my will nor was it ever my intention that should continue i have another thing for you to do and it is for that that i have brought you here to teach you what you could not have learned yourself and to train you for my work so he has this message this divine message in the jail where he is told that it was necessary for him to come here he could not have skipped this experience what was the experience it's very important to understand for us he says he felt as if god had placed the geeta he is saying in first person in my hands his strength had entered into me and i was able to do the sadhana of the geeta so the book which helped shri aurobindo to make this transition from an active political worker to the primary yogic sadhak is the geeta geeta is the book which helps him make this transaction a uh, transition i was not only to understand intellectually but to realize that shri krishna had demanded of arjuna and what he demands of those whom he aspires to do his work to be free from repulsion and desire to do work for him without demand for fruit to renounce self will and to become a passive and faithful instrument in his hands hands of the divinity to have an equal heart for high and low friend and opponent success and failure yet not to do his work negligently so this is a beautiful exposition of the famous uh, shloka karmanye vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana he has summarized in english the whole thing and he says that it is in jail that he realizes the real meaning of it it is at this point now that he explains that the message of krishna once given on the fields of kurukshetra to arjuna has a new vocabulary for us today and in the words of shri aurobindo we speak often of hindu religion of sanatan dharm but few of us really know what religion is other religions are preponderately preponderatingly religions of faith and profession but sanatan dharm is life itself it is a thing that has not so much to be believed as lived now you see this is one of the fundamental definitions of hindu faith or hindu darshanas or sanatan dharma and the contrast 
that is now being discussed a lot, at least in the last 10 years, the contrast with the Abrahamic religions. Sri Aurobindo says that Sanatan Dharma, Hinduism, is something to be practiced and lived, not just believed and professed. What is the difference between what a Christian or a Muslim believes and professes? He says that it is to be lived and not just believed because he doesn't take the name of Christianity and Islam but that is, that is obvious that in these religions you have a particular belief Jesus is the son of God born of Mary there is no other God than Allah there is no other prophet and you believe it and you start and you end with just that belief. But in the Indian system of call it yoga or sadhana or worship or puja or karma or yajna or whatever, it is to be experienced by lived. Sri Aurobindo, to my mind, does not just believe that it is to be lived by just going to the temple or wearing a certain color of clothes or having a tripund or any exterior marks, exter uh, external marks, but it is to be lived as a experience of the inner self, as transformation of the inner self. This is the great contrast that Shri Aurobindo makes. Something which has been time and again, time and again mentioned by our great sages, like Bhartri Hari says that Swana Bhutim Ekam Manaya Namaha Shantaya Tejase. That for Shiva, who is Shanta, and who is full of light or tej or power. What is the best way, the only ekam anai, what is ekam swanabhuti? You know him by self-experience, by direct knowledge, by sadhana, by understanding, not by just believing that I am told that it is so, that it is written either in my scripture or in my holy book or in the words of my teacher. This is a very important uh, distinction that Sri Aurobindo made. And he says that Sanatan Dharma, which is to be lived, is the salvation of humanity, which was cherished in the seclusion of this peninsula of old. We should be glad that Sri Aurobindo has said this and in these many words, in this peninsula of old, that is, he is not saying that Sanatan Dharma is something which has, which is everywhere and it comes out of everywhere, no. It has been born, nourished and will expand to the rest of the world from India this peninsula of old. So Sanatan Dharma is not something which is without any connection with a territory or a piece of land. You see, many people say that, like these days I hear a lot that yoga doesn't belong to India or yoga doesn't belong to one place or yoga doesn't belong to a culture. Well, yoga is not restricted to a culture, but it certainly belongs. It was born here, it came out of here, it flourished out of here. Shri Aurobindo makes that connection in black and white, peninsula of old. It is to give this religion that India is rising. 
and he says india india this peninsula this land this bharat is rising to give sanatan dharma to the world so the value of the land and the nation you know we live in a world today of great hypocrisy in which nations call nationalism bad for india but good for themselves they can fight a war on basis of nationalism as is now going on you know nation either one nation leading a group of nation to attack another great nation but they say that nationalism is something wrong and bad for india and they say that this is disastrous and there is a lot of criticism about this as you can find but shri aurobindo is clear in his mind that indian nationalism is there as sanatan dharma and that it belongs to the land as much as it belongs to rest of the world he will say many things in clarification and i shall and note this she does not rise that is india does not rise as other countries do for self when she is strong to trample on the weak she is rising to shed eternal light entrusted to her over the world so shri aurobindo does not mince any words in making it clear that india has a mission and that mission is sanatan dharma then he talks of the great experience that he had in alipur jail which is the crux of his spiritual experience that is the the navneet or the you know the makhan or the real thing of his experience the core and it is nothing else but what was said in the upanishad sarvam idam khalu brahma that all this is brahma this stable this chair this room this five elements this world material world and beyond all that is brahma and shri aurobindo has this experience and he in the place of brahma uses the word vasudev that all is vasudev sarvam idam khalu vasudev this is not a sentence he has said but this is what he means but what he has said will make it clear for you i walked under the branches of a tree in front of my cell but it was not a tree i knew it was vasudev it was shri krishna whom i saw standing and holding me in his shade i looked at the bars of my cell the very grating etc etc and i again saw vasudev it was narayan who was guarding and standing as a sentry over me or i lay on the course of blankets that were given to me for a couch i felt the arms of shri krishna around me the arms of my friend and lover this was the first use of the deeper vision he gave so everything is vasudev vasudev as sakha he says beloved and friend so it is his sakha bhav you know bhakti is always done in a relationship either you think of the divinity as a child or as a husband or as a lover or as a uh, lord as a master or as a friend sakha so this is sakha bhakti I looked at the prisoner in the jail the thieves the murderers and I saw Vasudev 
Among the decoits and thieves, there were many who put me to shame by their sympathy, their kindness. So everything, whether it was high or low, it is Vasudev. And he is just giving us the experience which Shri Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the true jnani or the man of knowledge has, that he looks upon the Brahmana and the one who eats a dog in the same way, with the same equanimity. So this is the experience, Sri Aurobindo. And he then even gives us a contemporary Bengali expression. He says that very often we consider these people as lower or as chota lok. <laughs> you know, chota lok, the Bengali understands. So he says, no, it is all Vasudev. And then he goes on to show, goes on to repeat, because there is a limitation of time, so I am not reading it out. He says, everything was Vasudev, even when he was presented before the magistrate, he saw nothing. But I looked, it was not the magistrate whom I saw, it was Vasudev, it was Narayan. And then, when the trial opened, he goes on to describe how he was helped and he knew that a lawyer who was pleading his case, Chitaranjan Das, Shri Jutki Chitaranjan Das, whom he says toiled day and night to make his case very strong, Shri Aurobindo's case very strong, would win and he would be out of jail. Now, this is the message that Sri Aurobindo gets. Therefore, whatever clouds may come, whatever dangers and sufferings, whatever difficulties, there is nothing impossible. I am in the nation and it's uprising and I am Vasudev. So Sri Aurobindo here makes it clear that it was not just a personal experience, that he saw Vasudev in everything. Hmm? It was not just that, but he gets the message that whatever task you had undertaken, the political task of fighting for the freedom of India is also being taken care of and he heard the voice saying to him, I am guiding, therefore fear not. Turn to your work for which I have brought you in jail. And when you come out, remember never to fear, never to hesitate. Remember that it is I who am doing it, not you or any other. So firstly, Sri Aurobindo in the jail has reached the supreme realization prescribed in the Gita that you don't do anything. It is all being done. Just as Krishna says to Arjuna, don't think that you will kill them. <laughs> they are already killed because they are destined to be killed. This is what is going on. So you only go into looking at it, into Sakshi Bhava. And this is the Sakshi Bhava which he says, he hears this voice telling him. I am in the nation and it's uprising, I am Vasudev, I am Narayan. And what I will be, shall be and what others will, what I choose to bring about, no human power can stay or prevent. So, in this way, he says, to Sri Aurobindo that you now go ahead on the path that I have prescribed to you. And before that, a thing happened suddenly and in a moment I was hurried away to the seclusion of a solitary cell. It is there that the divine 
showed him something. Quote, he showed me his wonders and made me realize the utter truth of Hindu religion. Now, after relating the presence of Vasudev in the political struggle and the rise of India and Sanatan Dharma, he also says that Vasudev made me realize the truth of Hindu religion. He says, I had read a lot about it. But now, day after day, I realized in my mind, I realized in the heart, I realized in the body, body the truths of Hindu religion. They became living experiences to me and things were open to me which no material science could explain. And he makes it now crystal clear. When I first approached him, it was not entirely in the spirit of a jnani. I came to him along in Baroda some years before I began Swadeshi. I was drawn into the public field. When I approached God at that time, I had hardly a living faith in him. The agnostic was in me, the atheist was in me, the skeptic was in me, and I was not absolutely sure that there was God at all. I did not feel his presence. So he's talking about his early revolutionary days or his Baroda days where he uh, taught uh, French in, in University of, uh, MS University of Baroda. And let me just share something very personal. I have the good fortune of done my PhD research for two years sitting in that room, studying there, the room in which Sri Aurobindo used to teach. So I always feel that the ideas and the thoughts that I got were not unconnected with Sri Aurobindo. So he says, the, I did not feel his presence, yet something drew me to the truth of Vedas, to the truth of Gita, to the truth of Hindu religion. I felt there must be a mighty truth somewhere in this yoga, a mighty truth in this religion. So he says, earlier he was searching but now, he had realized all that in jail and as a result, two messages came to him. The first message, I have given you a work which is to uplift this nation. Before long, the time will come when you will have to go out of jail and it is not my will that this time you should either be convicted or that you should pass this time as others have to do in suffering for their country. I give you the Adesh to go forth and do my work. And the second message is, something has been shown to you in this year of seclusion, something about which your doubts and truth of Hindu religion. It is this religion that I am raising before the world. It is this that I have perfected and developed through the Rishi, Saints, Avataras. And now it is going forth to do my work among the nations. Now what can be more clear than this? That the message that came to Sri Aurobindo is that Hinduism is going to work wonders for the world. It is the great knowledge, the learning, the works and the, uh, and the granthas produced by the Rishi, saints and avatars. And now it is going forth to do my work among nations. I am raising up this nation to send forth my word. So India will be doing that. This is Sanatan Dharma. This is eternal religion, which you did not really know before but which now I have revealed to you. So this is the experience. When you go forth, speak to your nation always this word that it is for Sanatan Dharma that they arise. 
So the political struggle and the freedom of India becomes part of the upliftment and expansion of Sanatan Dharma. When I say that it is reassertion of Sanatan Dharma, as I have titled this talk, reassertion of Sanatan Dharma, then I am only trying to remind you of what Sri Aurobindo has said here in black and white. I am giving them freedom for the service of the world. When therefore it is said that India shall rise, it is Sanatan Dharma that shall be great. So, the rise of India, cultural heights that India will achieve, political freedom that India will achieve, and what the message it shall give to all the nations is synonymous with Sanatantha. And then he says, when it is said India shall expand and extend itself, it is Sanatan Dharma that shall expand and extend itself over the world. So you see, Sri Aurobindo does not uh, feel hesitant in saying that India has something most beautiful, most essential to give to the rest of the world. He, he is not somebody who just believes in simple equality, that all nations and all people of the world are equal. Yes, they are equal, but India has something special. And that special is Sanatan Dharma. I have shown you that I am everywhere in all men and all things, that I am in this movement, that I am not only working in those that are striving for the country, I am working all in those who also stand in the path. So you see, this is the Sanatan vision, that your enemy is not ch enemy, he seems to be an enemy. That is why in the Vaishnava belief, Ravan is not an evil. Ravan was only an agency for the avatar to happen and Ravan also attains moksha because it is the equality of things. They are also doing my work. They are not my enemies, but my instruments. You aim at a result at your efforts, subserve one that is different or contrary. It is Shakti that has gone forth and entered the people. Since long I have been preparing for this uprising and now the time has come for fulfillment. So Shri Aurobindo is convinced. I'll take just five minutes more and conclude, but what is this Hindu religion? What is this religion which we shall call Sanatan eternal? It is Hindu religion only because the Hindu nation has kept it, because in this peninsula it grew up in the seclusion of the sea and Himalayas, because it is in the sacred and ancient land that it was given the charge to the Aryan race to preserve through the ages. Aryan race does not mean here the the, you know, the Western uh, definition of Aryan. It means Aryan as Shreshta. So, it is not to be circumcised in the confines of a country. And he then adds, it is not one religion which enables us only to understand and believe this truth, but to realize it in every part or of our being. That it is the Leela of Vasudev it is one religion which shows how we can best play our part in it. And then he finally rounds up the whole thing. I spoke once before with this force in me and I said that this movement is not a political movement and that nationalism is not politics but a religion. A creed and a faith, I say it again. I put it in another way. I say that it is Sanatan Dharma, which for us is nationalism. So you can see that it is political struggle, that it is fighting at the ground level for independence, political independence, 
and yet it is fighting according to the great vision of sanatan dharma which is the the only way the world can save itself this hindu nation was born with sanatan dharma and with it moves and with it grows so he makes it clear that there is no point in saying that hinduism is not sanatan dharma as some people say that hinduism is separate and sanatan dharma is separate shri aurobindo has made this all enveloping and the final thing he says the sanatan dharma that is nationalism it is the message that i have to speak to you final message sanatan dharma is nationalism now shri aurobindo's vision as you can see is the vision of the great rishis and the great tradition which is coming on that's why he uses the word sanatan dharma he does not use any other specific term very often people say that today indian nationalism is something which is separate or hindutva is something separate from what shri aurobindo meant now that is not true you see this idea of shri aurobindo was followed by people in various ways in the rest of the 20th century this idea of vasudev being everywhere of nishkam karma as it was called by lokmanya tilak in his famous uh, commentary on gita comes out of this very speech so to speak and it is even veer savarkar in 1925 he goes on to define the same thing only that he emphasizes more the land and the location when he defines hinduism or hindutva then he defines because he says that what is according to him the definition the one who believes in this land that land which is as as sindhu uh, samantat from sindhu to sindhu one who believes that this is my bharat bhumi my nation one who believes that this is my land in which i am born and one who believes that this is something to which i am committed and which is punya now punya means cultural punya means what the rishis have said punya means sanatan otherwise punya has no meaning it does not mean some kind of a show or some kind of a procession or some kind of a political jargon it only means what shri aurobindo made it clear shri aurobindo has used the word hindu again and again shri aurobindo has used the land peninsula he defines so where is the contradiction between what savarkar says as a matter of fact savarkar is inspired by this all the later thinkers are deeply inspired by shri aurobindo's idea of sanatan dharma as nationalism this is something you will discover again and again of course uh there was another strand of thought which was followed by uh mohandas karamchand gandhi and jawarlal nehru who believed in a kind of a secular understanding of the nation and the world but shri aurobindo's vision of the truth is not restricted to material concerns it goes far beyond that it goes into this vision that he has talked about it goes into this whole heritage the darshanas the understanding that our rishis have of sanatan dharma and this is what he asserts and says that this is what is going to be and should be true nationalism for all purposes thank you very much